Okay, welcome to the Integral Stage, Greg. Nice to see you again. Thanks so much for having me back, Bruce. It's great to be here. Yeah, we've been talking privately by by email about you know the last episode we did and, and some things that we felt needed further exploration. So that's what we're taking time for today. And in the last conversation, we focused mostly on the three qualia that you and John have explored and unfolded in the Untangling the World Not of Consciousness series. And we explored some of the relationship to my grammatology. And I know in your own system, you have a distinction between the three minds, mind one, mind two, and mind three, as yep. part of your contribution towards untangling that world knot of consciousness. So I wanted to just start to ask you if you could unpack for us a little bit your understanding of the three minds and what their relationship um, is to the three qualia that we talked about before. Perfect. Yeah, and this will be great because it will set up, uh, then we can maybe segue into some mind two, mind three relation and get back to grammatology uh, and, and what I see in those uh, particular relations, uh, especially the how mind two goes into mind three in terms of language and then what that means about the structure of grammar and the various forms of grammar that you've elucidated. So, yeah, so uh, I developed a thing called a map of mind as a way of, this gets uh, the background. Let me give a little bit of background just so that people can be a little bit familiar. As, as people have followed me know, I'm obsessed with a thing called the problem of psychology. Uh, and so the problem of psychology uh, refers to the fact that my discipline uh, claims that it's the science of behavior and mental process. Yet when you get into it and ask, well, what does my discipline agree uh, that it is meant by behavior and mental process, you find very, very limited agreement and radically different viewpoints. Indeed, five to 10% of the psychologists are just behaviorists and they argue the whole, it's a science of behavior. <laughs> so that gives you a good start. You could imagine as is like, there'd be 10% of biologists is like, no, it's, it's the science of cells, but we don't believe in life. So it's just the science of cells. So like, but life is, what is that? You know, it's like, no, they, so, so the discipline is really confused. And what I discovered essentially is this, is that um, I argue that behavior really emerges for a whole host of different reasons, but what it gets solidified is the epistemological perspective of natural science on the mental, okay? So, and if we go to Wilbur from a, and use a pronoun perspective, it's the third person perspective on the mental. And, and what behavior is, is the, it allows you to then gain access to the mental okay? from the vantage point of an, of an objective scientist. That's what I uh, really, that behavior becomes. Then the question is, well, what do you mean then by mental process? Okay? And then the, all the different traditions, well, behaviorism saying that, you know, at least the Skinnerian and other versions are like, well, it's an unnecessary term. And then you have all the other different traditions. And then what I argue is, is that there are three core reference points ontological reference points that are also defined by various epistemological positions uh, that then give rise to a heretofore uh, unseen map of mental process that I think is absolutely necessary to get our vocabulary correct, okay? So the first level of mind one refers to the neuroinformation processing uh, that is the, so the nervous system, the modern and the vast majority of of people I think would say, although they would mean many things by it, and we can talk about what we mean by neuroinformation processing, at a basic structural level, the nervous system is an information processing system. That means it takes in sensory input at some level. It has some hierarchical computational structure that is trying to make sense out of the environment and trying to predict what is going to happen in the environment and then coordinate motor output in accordance with that information processing structure. Okay. So I think that this is, so mind one then refers to the actual overt activity of an animal that you could see and it's neurocognitive functionalist structure that does not necessarily refer specifically to anti-subjective experience of being, okay? So in my book, I use the example of, uh, from a, uh, a neuroscience analysis of praying mantis, okay? and the praying mantis behavior of a hunter and how a praying mantis will, will, will wait and stalk prey and then and look for prey avoidance mechanisms and do all of this. 
um, and then how the optic tectum manages information and how it coordinates its action. And you can develop a very rich uh, description of a praying mantis, okay, with the neurocognitive functionalist architecture. And we have no idea, there's different opinions as to whether or not the praying mantis has anything that it is like to be consciousness, a praying mantis. Okay, so that's a different, I'm reading books right now with different approaches that argue different things as to whether or not. What it is like to be, this is from Thomas Nagel and then into David Chalmers, this is subjective conscious experience of being, the behind the eyes point of view. Um, and this is by what I mean, mind two. So mind two refers to our subjective conscious experience of being. And the argument is, is that it emerges out of various hierarchical and information integrated processes okay, uh, that start with the base of valence qualia, at least this is what I will argue, uh, which is essentially that pleasure and pain serve as the broadcasting, organizing signals that then start the process of a centralized broadcast function. And then that's gonna move and early animals that just had procedural reflexes into much more a participatory and dynamic relation. And that's gonna to correspond to operant conditioning and other more sophisticated forms of learning. Um, so that's the base of it. That jump into qualia, into the emergence of pleasure and pain, that becomes the base of sentience or the base of mind too. Okay. But it's just the base of mind too and not a full throated or full body experience of consciousness. I believe these things are present in things like fish and I'm inclined to believe they're present in even a number of insects, okay? Have these base pleasure and pain mechanisms. But what I don't think they have is the full perspectival and participatory phenomenology of a conscious, a subjective experience of consciousness across time, <clears throat> okay? Um, that means that, that gives rise to the difference between a perceiver that has perspectival knowledge and would be what John Verveke calls adjectival qualia, which is the hereness, nowness, and of aspectualizing perspective. And then adjectival qualia, which is now a full embodied experience, a screen that has adjectival qualities on it. And what we then see here is the distinction between perspectival and participatory knowing as two fundamentally different elements and the extension of a declarative memory system that creates much greater temporal unity across time. Uh, and we see this really in the social animals, birds like crows, elephants, and the social primates. Um, so this is really a second, it allows for much more deliberation. It allows for much more simulation. It requires the cortex and the thalamus loop. Um, and this is basically, I call this the deliberative don't mind because it allows for a working memory and it would have then uh, the, so the three qualia here is the valence qualia jumps from mind one, a non-conscious functional system, and gives rise to the emergence of what I believe is the broadcast subjectivity. And that grows into an extended subjectivity that has adjectival as the screen of experience and adverbial as the perceiver. Okay. And then that's the complete mind two package. So mind two then mostly gets boxed in by a valence qualia, a perceiver and a perceived across time. Okay. And then finally, mind three, and notice that is all, which makes it so scientifically difficult to, epistemologically, that is first person. It's not accessible to the third person. The, all those dimensions, the, the emergent qualia, they're all from within. <laughs> and we have to infer, that's why we still don't know if a brain mantis feels anything or not. Hell, it's kind of hard if I know, if other people know I feel stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right? I do. You know, I'm not a zombie. Um, and you can be confident I'm not a zombie, which I argue is the whole idea of zombies has always been a thought experiment, because in the human world, we're intersubjective creatures. That means that you're always checking in. So, Bruce, how do you feel about that? Right? And then you, what that means is that there's that phenomenological experiential self of subjectivity that you're referring to, that you're introspecting on. And this is the jump then from mind three. So mind three is linguistically mediated, self-reflective tied together that then can tell a narrative of the perceiver perceived experience across time and then share that through the skin mediated through language. And the remarkable thing that I always emphasize in mind three is actually 
you always say, oh, everybody's mind's all private. It's like, well, certainly not language, <laughs> right? I mean, you have full-fledged access to all my thinking. All I just need to do is go from language to speech. It's just, speech then turns it publicly without uh, transitioning. So this out here then, uh, and then I'll finally, I'll just bring up then this map. Uh, I'll share my screen real fast just so people can see it and then we can come back and talk about its relation. So here is the uh, map of mind. So you have mind 1A, which is inside the nervous system. This is the neuro information processing pre-conscious elements uh, that then regulates procedural action. Then there is a jump, and I believe it starts with the base of sentience and pleasure and pain, and then goes up into a fully interior subjective perceiving of the perceived experience and phenomenology and the experiential self. That's mind two. Then we get mind three, which is in humans. I do not think, I think animals have some basic capacity for proto self-awareness, you know, elephants and apes. I mean, they're really complicated, but they don't have language-based self-reflective narration. Uh, and that opens up a whole new level of mind. Uh, and mind 3A refers to how we would say things privately to ourselves, our inner speech. And mind three then is what you're, what we're recording right here as I'm talking, uh, mind 3B is now, and then what this does is it maps the exterior epistemology from the outside. This would be a behavior vantage point, uh, the inside, and then the transition from uh, neurology into neuroinformation processing or neurocognition. Um, so that's the element the, in terms of qualia. The base of it is pleasure and pain driving the system. And then the emergence of adjectival, full-fledged perspectival adjectival and then adverbial is the actual perceiver perceived relation that then is uh, operative in us and other higher animals. So I'll stop sharing and uh, see if you wanna riff off of any of that. <laughs> sure, that was great, thank you. Yeah, um, several things came to mind and so I'm gonna try to pull them together and see what, you know, which ones we should follow first. One, I wanna just tell you a very short story that is really neither here nor there, but I wanted to share it. In, it was a, a somewhat quasi-mystical experience when I used to work out in the desert southwest. I worked, I was a young man at the time, and I worked at a convenience store out in the middle of the desert. Okay. Classical southwest <clears throat> desert scene where you hear coyotes howling in the middle of the night and there's an empty deserted highway. <laughs> and I was outside working and came across a praying mantis sitting on top of a pole and just stopped and the, the praying mantis was, you know, looking at me like that. Yep. And I could see into its black eyes and then the, 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 the expanse of the stars uh. out behind it. And where my mind went was that there is some kind of loop uh, evolutionarily between me looking there into that and through the whole universal unfolding of evolutionary pathways that these two points of contact were meeting. Yep. And I have no idea if the uh, praying mantis was consciously registering anything. I think mm -hmm. it's wise to remain relatively agnostic about that. I lean in the direction that it does. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I lean in the direction mm -hmm. of panpsychism, which I know mm -hmm. both you and John, um, don't really agree with, but in terms of a scientific account, I think the naturalist emergentist is the most grounded and, uh, and reasonable that we have right now. Mm -hmm. Going in the direction of panpsychism for me is a speculation that I'm willing to indulge, but totally yeah. recognize that it's a speculation. Well, we're in the same, I think we're in the same basic ballpark. I, I meaning, that I'm drawn and I have moments, spiritual moments of a full cosmic conscious experience at some level of wholeness, right? An awakening um, that would then really speak and resonate um, with, you know, so my mythic is sort of a panpsychic cosmic conscious awakening. <laughs> That's my mythos in some ways. My scientific, you know, my scientific training and then the metaphysics of that get me scratching my head in certain ways and, and bring critical eye to it. But I think that we're, it sounds like we really are sharing that dialectic in almost exactly the same way. Right. One way I've looked at like the idea of proto consciousness. And again, it may, I, it may not work from, you know, 
the uh, neurocognitive point of view, for instance. But for me, one way to think about it is just the registration of difference. Mm -hmm. So the degree that any element is able to register difference, yep. um, that qualifies as a kind of information communication. Yep. Um, you know, that, that, that takes place, that there's an interior, there's a shift within the interior of that thing in response to something um, yep. in its surround. And, and that basic registration of difference, if there's any kind of quality to that at all, um, very minimal, maybe white heady in just the prehension yep. of that moment, mm -hmm. um, I could see that, but again, it would be nothing like the perception of color or the hearing right. of, yeah, anything like that. Yeah, I mean, the tree of knowledge uh, depicts what it's mapping is complexification across time. And there's then a continuity of complexification. I mean, this is what Wilbur talks about in the whole lines. Uh, and there, so there are things that are going from very basic, first you get this basic differentiate, I mean, undifferentiated energy singularity, and then you get these basic, differentiations of a pers of some kind of perspective. He emphasizes, you know, first person. I'm like, eh, I don't like that exactly. But, but there's the inside and the outside, and there's an increased complexification whereby you can certainly trail, you know, a clear line of, of growing complexification and growing processes of internal cognition. And I'm totally fine with cognition at the biological level. Like, I think that I have friends who emphasize cell cognition. Okay, so... I, sentience, I don't, because I reserve sentience for the for the Nigelian first person experience of being. I argue that I'm not very, uh, my sentience goes away when I'm in a deep sleep or when I'm anesthetized, you know, so that comes off. But my, the cells, like the way my system is digesting food and, and pumping my heart through the system and pulling oxygen, all of that, that's actually, you can definitely, they're deliberate agent arena relations that are metabolizing information in particular ways. So um, I think that those things, and then that continuity. Um, so there's a very fine line between the overarching picture is I think very consistent with that and what, you know, what we call it and what we ultimately end on calling it, you know, we'll see. But. Right, sometimes um, I, I first met Lehman Pascal in dialogues around the question of panpsychism or not. Mm -hmm. And kind of one of the ways that we ended up framing it is that we want to frame panpsychism as if it's emergentism and emergentism as if it's panpsychism in a way right. that you kind of blur, you blur that because I think there's something true possibly about both accounts. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I would lean less definitively towards the panpsychic that it's mm -hmm as strongly established. Um, but there's that persistence of the, the hard problem, which I, I think, you know, you and John have beautifully wrestled with in, in that video series. And it's a, a really important one that as, as you both explore and recognize as, you know, ethical and moral and, and social ramifications, ecological ramifications. Right. So it's really important to get right. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I think that the, there are, it's very plausible, I think very plausible, and certainly important to be clear that, you know, John and I are certainly honing in on co uh, human consciousness as is experienced in the natural world and every day. Like I'm conscious of you right now, I see those red things behind me. What are the layers that I wanna to try to explain, right? It's connection to the idea, you know, I'm, I find like there's a, the, the, a map of the singularity I find to be almost I find a religious experience tracking the evolution of complexity on a hyperbolic curve that crosses over <laughs> to reach vertical in 2028 of all times. You know, um, I see those things as at least the possibility of a cosmic consciousness awakening, you know, and Steve McIntosh would be certainly somebody who emphasizes evolution's purpose. Um, I think that's, I still think of that as mythos, you know, um, but it's a beautiful mythos. I think that it connects to our morality. And I wouldn't be amazed. I would be, well, I'd be awestruck, but um, I'd be less uh, taken aback if it turns out that in fact we are, that something is, you know, part of a harmonizing process and maybe even involve you and that praying mantis back in, uh, in you know, in the, the desert night so long ago. Do you know the work of Henrik Skolomowski? He's an ecological philosopher who mm -hmm 
developed a, a model of, of participatory mind. Uh. One of the things that he used to emphasize, I, I don't know if he's really writing in this area anymore, but he used to talk about the evolution, um, the course of evolution as basically the refinement of modes of sensitivity. Mm. From very, very basic modes of just registering difference all the way up to mm -hmm. uh, more and more sophisticated ways of gathering in information and integrating it um, with greater depth. Uh, David Bohm also has an interesting model, which is not his familiar uh, Im you know, implicit order and explicit mm -hmm. order, though it's related. It's one that I think he only talked about in a single essay and never developed, mm. which is a model that he calls soma significance mm -hmm. and signosomatics. Mm. And basically he sees it as, you know, a Mobius kind of strip where every form is really a conjunction of form, meaning, and energy mm. at, at every level of unfolding of any form will mm. carry some significance for anything else um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, yep. even, you know, very base levels of reality and that there's this interplay of energy significance mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and form and that form is significant. Significance is form. Both are energetic. Uh, well, I, I see energy information as the two glue fields that bind uh, sort of those uh, two ingredients to make the unified field that is what I'm trying to map with the uh, tree of knowledge system. So that's, that feels very resonant. Uh, and I love the, you know, the, and what it's trying to track really is complexification across the various scales. And if we then follow the line of complexification and the rate of complexification across, you know, a continuity, it, it that, that lines up quite uh, nicely as far as I'm concerned. Great. Yeah. So I, I wanted to kind of circle in to some of the, the grammatology talk. And mm -hmm. I wanted to just point out one thing, uh, which I think people familiar with the talk from before, when you were giving your account, you were talking about the aspectual here now mm -hmm. together, giving rise to then the, the um, screen of yep. qualia, which is the, the phenomenal. And you called both adjectival, which oh, I did I? all the time. So, <laughs> you know, sorry. You, yeah, spectralizing is the adverbial. And adverbial, then the that's right. The adjectival. Right, okay. so, yeah, and I'll just reiterate that. Sorry, I do still do that. I shouldn't do that. In fact, it was, I was listening to John and his, his conversation, his, his discussion of consciousness, and it's a teasing apart of adjectival and adverbial that a light bulb went off. And just to make it clear for people, so that John identifies in meditation, people who achieve a pure consciousness event. Um, when you achieve a pure consciousness event, that observer essentially becomes what is, you know, and you dissipate into and you lose greenness and redness and the qualities, the adjectival qualities. And just what remains is the aspectualizing here-ness, now-ness, and togetherness of being. Okay. So it's sort of the observer becomes observed in some mapped on feedback loop. And then people, and I, I'm not much of a meditator, I haven't had this experience. I've had similar, but not exactly same experiences. So that just gives you how distinct the adjectival quality versus adverbial aspectualizing uh, should be. And thanks for catching that. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I think it's really, it's a great distinction and I, I like it a lot. And I've been thinking, one of the things I felt we didn't cover in our talk last time, because it is so important in Wilbur's work, is the place of uh, the pronouns, the, the perspectives, mm -hmm. and even his more fundamental distinctions uh, of, of the, the quadrants, the inside mm -hmm. and the outside and the interior and the exterior. And I think there are different ways to hold that. One thing that he would emphasize is that the most fundamental elements in cosmogenesis with the K and mm -hmm. spelling it with the K means in a sense, the emergence of experienced worlds, yep. um, not just the scientific cosmological account. For yep. this. Mm -hmm. uh, but he would say that inside, outside, and singular and plural are the key distinctions. Yes. And 
I was thinking there, there's a way to render that that actually participates with the aspectualizing adverbial mm. in that there's the here-ness, there's the now-ness, there's the togetherness. And that togetherness is actually, you could also say there's the possibility of aloneness or togetherness, mm -hmm. whether there's the singular or plural. Mm. Um, and there's the inside and outside, which are actually both adverbs. They can be used adverbially. Mm -hmm. So possibly mm -hmm. that whole initial aspectualizing or modal kind mm -hmm. of setting up of the screen of consciousness mm -hmm. could have those fundamental elements mm -hmm. to it that's not, not yet the I, the feeling of I, but it's, it's the setting up of that, um, that clearing uh, of, of, of base consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. And so uh, for me, what, and let's see, so in general, the emergence of sentience, okay, and then into the aspectualizing adverbial of the adjectival, that, that growth, that's the real, in the naturalistic sense that I would emphasize. Which, so I have a slightly different ontology than Wilbur's capital K. But in my naturalistic sense, that's basically what we're doing is we're mapping the upper left, the emergence of uh, and the consolidation of the experience of upper left, you know, that goes from um, echoes of proto experience, what I would argue proto experience at the level of life and, and zero, well, experiential being and, z and essentially zero experience at the level of pure matter to use the tree of knowledge, you know, like a like a rock in my estimation, to say what a rock experiences is, loses meaning. To say what a cell <clears throat> experiences or what a plant experiences is a good question. Um, I still think it's pretty much like a, a biological robot, you know? um, but that's a great question. So the, the praying mantis, so that praying mantis uh, in my estimation should be starting to have that valence quality at least if it, uh, there's an embodied representation oh i want to move towards the prey and ooh, move away from the predator um uh, how much then that evolves into genuine adjectival and adverbial quality becomes the question but all of what we're trying to do there is fill in that upper left first person experience of the individual but then the question then about like how we place that in collective right uh, across all the all the various perspectives and then the inside out, you know, is, is great. And, and what I'm hearing you play with there uh, is I'm hearing you play with sort of uh, prepositional positioning, you know, around that in a way that is really, really fun and enriching. Right, right. Yeah, there are definitely <laughs> ways that what I just said could be framed prepositionally as well. So I think we can hold them Loosely, I mean, the main thing, you know, wanting to look at is, is how do these, you know, fundamental elements play together in a, in a, in a convincing way, uh, you know, a way that, that aligns with what we can observe. And I think whether we stick with just the emergence of, uh, you know, consciousness at the human level and what's going on there, I think we could be on sh more sure ground in terms of talking about that. Right. The idea here would be there's no kind of uh, experience at all without some kind of inside outside um, right. differentiation. Mm -hmm. um, but again, yeah, maybe we don't have to go down that you know too far because it, it's hard to really say, but it makes sense to me that without some kind of very basic mm -hmm. structure or processor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, that, that there's not going to be any kind of registration. Of course, it's, it's hard to say because, you know, in, in Tibetan tradition, they have something called sleep yoga, which I did for, you know, a number of years. There's yep. a dream yoga where you practice becoming lucid in dreams, and then you can yep. work with them in different ways. And there's a sleep yoga, which is basically you remain awake for several days while meditating and visualizing and then you go to sleep in a very particular way that actually for me it allowed me to watch 
different aspects of my meaning making system go offline. Fascinating. Like I could track when hearing disappeared. Oh, wow. And I could track when the body sense disappeared. And so it just like pop, 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 pop. Unbelievable. You can, you can follow that um, where they go offline. And then you end up in this place where you can't really make any differentiations. There's no registration of, of qualities. And it's easy to slip into just total forgetfulness and, and unconsciousness. So part of that practice is for people to wake you up after you've mm. transitioned into that and ask you a question immediately so that there's a freshness yes. of that experience wow. that you can then kind of check in with. Beautiful. Yeah. So in that sense, the, you know, there is this merger into, you know, a space where it's hard to, it's hard to know that to name any kind of distinction inside, outside there's, right. Yeah. It, it gets into a different space. Totally. Yeah. No. And that's a, uh, I'm underdeveloped in those domains of meditation and exploration. And I know so many of the Eastern traditions have, um, cultivated that kind of conscious development in the various facets. And obviously Ken Wilber's a real expert on that as well. It's really uh, fascinating stuff, uh, unbelievably and crucial for our understanding of consciousness and awareness across the scales of nature and whatever. Right, yeah, I think we really need to develop, you know, like what Francisco Varela and mm -hmm. Natalie DePraz and others were trying to develop with the neurophenomenology. Yep. Um, exactly. really tracking the correlations there. Right, right. So in moving into mind two, mm -hmm. um, where one way I was holding that, and you know, I, I know you say that your, your views changed a little bit through your dialogue with, mm -hmm. with John, um, but one way I'm relating to that is that once we get to recognizable sentient beings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for me the way i would look at mind two is somewhat in a humian kind of way mm -hmm. where there is at least initially in the development of any sentient being this adjectival flux mm -hmm. of of experiences mm -hmm. uh, of just basic registration of of you know, yep. color and, and sound and things like that. And then through kind of constant conjunctions of events, mm -hmm. the development of an object constancy and the development mm -hmm. of some kind of theory of causation at whatever level the, mm -hmm. the animal can hold that. Yep. So there's yeah. a kind of a pulling out of, of the verb and the noun mm -hmm. out of the adjectival flux where the, the, the there's a concretizing or a coalescing of, of that experiential qualitative field. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, uh, here's how I would say it now in terms of the, <clears throat> so what happened with John is when does the screen of adjectival qualia, adjectival <laughs> qualia, um, appear as part of the conscious matrix? Um, so we now have at least four different elements that are part of the conscious matrix. Um, so one, and what John and I discovered is that a prior to at least a complete screen is the integration of the valence qualia, okay? which this is what changed with me in terms of like, I didn't have this really differentiated. So, so I kind of had sort of an undifferentiated uh, emergence of adjectival qualia that would grow in sophistication over time. That was my original frame, which is still what I have, but now I can differentiate it. Okay. So now what I have is, all right, well, what's the first thing that was coming online was a shift from reflexive and procedural associative conditioning, which is essentially um, in what we would call relative to gross conscious, non-conscious. Okay. So like, you know, you just have a reflex, okay. Or you see in a snail, you can just do a look at a withdrawal reflex. Then what you get is the merging from associative conditioning and reflexes and habituation and sensitization, okay, into, um, actually I'm reading right here, I happen to write, I got it for Christmas, okay, the evolution of the sensitive soul, okay, 
uh, and learning and the origins of consciousness. Okay. Okay. And what they have is what, what I would call operant conditioning, but they call it unlimited associative learning. Okay. The flexible dynamic reward punishment that's identified in the history of psychology, essentially as the law of effect by Thorndike. Okay. Which is what he argued and put mental uh, elements on it, that pleasure and pain serve as the guidance system to generate effectual, consequential, dynamic learning. Okay. So what I'm seeing in the literature is then the system coming online for what John would call the participatory dynamic agent arena environment. Now, what I believe is happening then is whether or not there are this other book <laughs> that I'm identifies in sensory consciousness three different domains, um, which I identified also, one of which is perception of the external world, okay? one of which is interior perception of your body world, and the third, which is affective valence. Those are the three. In fact, I, I have a formulation called P relative to M equals E, all right? perception of the outside world relative to motivational state of what, I'm, what my body state is, what I wanna to move towards relative to E, which generalizes emotion, okay? So let's just put this in terms of you're feeling hungry, all right? And you're waiting and your wife brings out, you know, steak for Christmas dinner, right? And then all of a sudden you feel all oh, the desire, right? So that's perception, motivation, then you are approaching something that's good and you feel that desire. Um, so this is, a, and this is seen as sort of the core of the uh, behavioral investment system. Okay. So now the question is, well, what comes first? Do they all three emerge together? All right. Perception, motivation, and emotion as a cluster of this sentience. Okay. I now think I'm looking at, I think that actually what may emerge first is pleasure and pain as broadcasting qualia before there's any adjectival qualia, there's the broadcasting felt sense of approach and avoid. Okay. That's what I believe now based tracking what's happening, but there's arguments we don't know, but that's the, um, and then what emerges is a consolidation of perception as, as the system becomes organized. Okay. In dynamic learning, then what happens is, is that the system needs to do lots of both parallel process. Okay and focal process. Parallel process means it's gonna basically adjust to the dynamic relations. And then the focal are, what is the actual activity that you need to engage in, all right? And make decisions about go yes or no, see what it is. Now, one of the real features of our perceptual consciousness is that it does, part of its very design is that it creates figure ground relations. The adjectival screen creates figure ground relations. Okay. I was in the whole uh, thing. I kept going back to the duck rabbit <laughs> illusion, right? You see that duck rabbit beer or whatever. You know, anyone, everyone should be familiar with that. Google the duck rabbit illusion. And what it shows is you either see the duck or the rabbit and they'll fluctuate back and forth. But what, what we know about conscious experience that's quite different than the non-conscious processing is that it actually it functions to make the figure salient. Okay, that's the thing you are actually paying attention to. Okay, so what I'm believing happen is as the animal becomes more and more dynamically engaged, you get the general parallel processing, and then you get the focal figure ground emphasis that creates selection attention mechanisms. It's that focal figure ground emphasis that really then is the centralized broadcasting function that becomes the global neuronal workspace. That's another big theory of consciousness. Okay, and then that growth of that, the expansion of that creates working memory and creates the adjectival screen and the adverbial perceiver. That's what they grow into. So that by the time you get it to us and my dog Benji, you have very sophisticated capacities of a perceiver relative to a perceived that sits atop an affective guidance system. Does that make sense? It does, yes. So in terms of the the interior interoceptive and the, the external perception. Do you relate that then also to, you know, the, the perspectives of the I and the it with, with Wilbur? 
Well, um, yeah, you, you certainly you could. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily do it directly because I would depend on like all of this is like I'm trying to then empathize with what my dog Benji's experience is like. Okay, so from my dog's perspective, the outside certainly could be the it. Okay, and then the internal registration. Now, I would argue that the I-me relationship in my dog is much is grossly underdeveloped compared to an adult human. Okay. So adult, you and I have on top of this phenomenological experience, we have an ongoing narrator of I, me relation, all right? That gives rise to a huge self-concept, okay? That you just don't really see even in one and a half year old kids, two year old kids, you actually have to be socialized and developed to create a reflective self-concept. I don't think that the, my dog has much in the way of an I, me relation, okay? And therefore, even so, it's so itself simply it has a sense, it has a perspectival sense of self, okay? And it will certainly have a sense of friendly relation or hostile relation, and certainly a memory of episodes in relation, okay? But in terms of its self concept of like the kind of reflective narrating capacity it has, which then creates I, me, and even I, it, like in a, in a reflective sense, it, it, it's not going to have that kind of reflection. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Here I'm thinking more of just the very basic feeling, uh, the qualitative feeling that's interior yep. and, and then the perception of objects. So, so exactly, exactly. So at that level, at the basic level of there's a sense felt sense of meanness that needs to be detected. Just like, am I hungry? Where does my body end? What's going on with it? That's interior reception. Then there's the itness that's out, outside here. That's not part of me, but I need to relate to it. Then that's the P you perceive that's called exterior. So it's the exterior of the itness versus the interior of the meanness. And behavior fundamentally is about taking those two variables in relation and moving toward and away from various elements. That's the fundamental cybernetic system of what's inside of me and where am I? What's outside here and where is it? How do I then move toward and away? That's the guidance system of learning. And, and so, yeah, that's me, it, their relation, move toward or move away. Right, right. Uh, Slaughterdyke talks about something that I think is interesting, Peter Slaughterdyke. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've read his... Uh, Unfortunately not. Yeah. <laughs> Pureology. I, tr I try to read a lot and I still don't know much. You know, it's a tough world out there. <laughs> no, there's so many things. There's so many things. But one thing that he talks about, which I, I think is interesting, I don't... I wouldn't want to posit it as the, you know, the causal uh, mechanism for it, because I think we can observe it appears to be some self-consciousness in at least some higher mammals. Definitely. Um, not, you know, I, I don't think there's much of it in a dog or, or you know, some mm -hmm. other animals, but elephants and, and, and some other yep, animals. Anything that, that, that I love the mirror self-recognition. Uh, task that Gallup generated in 1972. That's a wonderful way to assess it. And certainly some animals have proto self-awareness, self-reflective uh, capacities that pass the mirror self-recognition test, absolutely. And, right, so what Slaughterdyke talks about is among the primates, mm -hmm. the, the humans are the only ones that gaze eye to eye with the baby. Yep. And it's that eye to eye gaze that generates in part, the, the, the differentiated self um, and the self-awareness, you know, in addition to language. Totally, um, yep. yep. In fact, here's another, I got a lot of wonderful books, uh, Becoming Human by Tomasello, Michael Tomasello. Uh, so he's been talking about this for a long time. So the, these are the architecture, the, co the social cognitive architectures pre-linguistic social cognitive architectures that tie us together as unbelievably social primates. Um, and what he talks a lot about is the capacity for shared attention, okay? Eye to eye contact and a, a theory of mind that also then creates a much greater intersubjective, implicit, I would call it, because it's pre-linguistic, uh, nonverbal implicit intersubjectivity, okay? The mother-child dance, the group of individuals that are engaged in hunting, all right? Um, and other shared kinds of practices. 
that humans were doing before language in a much more coordinated way. I mean, we certainly see apes will sometimes coordinate their hunting activities and other things, but the richness of human engagement, and there's a lot of cognitive architecture, like point, if I go up right there, you immediately intuit that I'm looking at something away. Kids will do this at 18 months or before. Um, they'll track eye contact and then they'll come back and they'll check in and they'll create this intersubjective participatory space that's pre-verbal and it's remarkable uh, capacities for sort of a shared theory of mind, intersubjective space, way more developed than other primates as far as we can tell. Right, right. All right, so I wanna look back a little bit at, at what you were just unpacked in terms of, of, I think that transition between mind one and mind two and when I was talking about mind two as uh, adjectival and then some further coalescing, that's my suggestion is, you know, one way to look at that is what I was actually trying to mirror uh, from your and John's conversation is that it's out of this base of, of you know, maybe it's at the transition between mind one and mind two, where there's this aspectualizing and prepositional kind of, there's the valence qualia, which are, mm -hmm. are setting the relational vectors. And there's that here now togetherness yep. um, that's there at that transition from, you could say unconscious, you know, processing where mm -hmm. there's this, there's this gathering that mm -hmm. happens and mm -hmm. a relational space setting that happens that then flowers into the adjectival field mm -hmm. where Yes, already, you know, I don't want to lay these out like they emerge in any kind of linear way. And I think there are hints overlapping at, at multiple mm -hmm. levels, but there's a different foregrounding or um, yep. something that, that receives primacy at a particular time. And so mm -hmm. it feels to me in, in terms of like reading Daniel Stern and other people who, you know, mm. track the emergence mm -hmm. of, uh, of the sense of self, but also just the emergence of, of self-object differentiation in children. Yep. Um, that there's the kind of beautiful count. He has these beautiful accounts of the baby being lost in the shining sun reflection on the floor, you know, and there's just in that, that qualia dance. Yep. Um, and there's a, you know, maybe the raising the hand, they don't know that they've raised their hand across the visual field. They just like, you know, they yep. just, you know, so that whole, there's a, not yet differentiated play of, of qualities that are arising out of this mm -hmm. adverbial prepositional, you know, mm -hmm. modal space setting, relational yep. space setting. Mm -hmm. And then in that flux, there's a coalescing mm -hmm. of, of the perceptions into, uh, you know, abiding objects and abiding mm -hmm. perceptions in a way mm -hmm. that then become basically you know, uh, differentiated as mm -hmm. my body, my world, you know, that object is going to stay there. Right. Cover it and, you know, right. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, we can track the development. Um, one of the things I wanted to get back to, and maybe this can lead into it. So, so for me now, when we get into this kind of space of where we're tracking the development of a child okay, uh, and the various ways in which they're relating to me, to it from various points of view and then coalescing and integrating. And of course, uh, we come prepared in our attachment relationships to track the significant others, the caretakers and tracking. And then we have then an emerging capacity to see things from other perspectives, step outside, you know, this is all. To me, what this is laying down, uh, what sets the stage for the mind two to mind three transition. Uh, in humans, and you know, in terms of both, then evolutionarily, uh, we can I want we can go back to it, and then developmentally in the course of an individual's life, um, and also for me, one of the things I'd like to re, uh, I think I touched on this in the last conversation, uh, but really delineate the, what happened with the justification hypothesis and systems, the mind two to mind three. And what then the grammar, grammatology analysis says about the intersubjective relational space and the relational space between our narrator and our mind to vision logic perceiver. Um, so if, if, that, if that sounds reasonable to you, I'd like to see if we can exp 
tease that apart as well in a kind of a continuing um, layering of these uh, pieces down from mind one to mind two, and then mind two into mind three, and then um, the way in which I connected language to both phenomenology and behavior. And, and I think what I experienced is your grammatology filled in a lot of, I started to do some of that, and then I saw uh, a much richer picture with the six different categories of grammar that emerged. Yes, definitely. If you'd like to just share, you know, what, what some of the pieces were um, that you felt, you know, could be filled in. Right. So um, basically, if where we are in this conversation, we're sharing with us as social primates, okay? And now, not only are we relating to the world, but we're relating to each other, and we're starting to develop the need for different perspectival shifting, okay? And tracking and developing theory of mind and attribution of why people are doing various things. That's, that's the stage that's set. Um, I believe that we're doing probably some basic things like humming and drumming, okay? To get us in particular harmonized implicit intersubjective rhythms. And then we start the process of symbolic tagging, okay? Now, my argument would be that the initial symbols that we tag are nouns. That would be, be a wonderful thing to wonder about, okay? But I would guess that in the, if we, and then we were to trace a number of developments across sort of grammatological development, <laughs> nouns are gonna come early, okay? All right? And verbs are gonna come close after. And, and so, uh, and this certainly happened to me. So here's what, so this is what I think was happening in terms of, uh, in my own, so I'm then thinking what my big insight in 1996 okay, is the idea that once you get enough language highway to ask questions, all right, it's a huge problem, <laughs> okay? It's like, because now I have access to all my subjectivity, which before is just naturally contained by, by the difference between subjective and objective, right? You know, to try to ask your dog what he really feels and it's hard and it's hard for other dogs to know, right? Uh, so that's always just been naturally contained. But now with language, if both of you have language, now you open up the intersubject highway, which is great for sharing thoughts, which everybody says, oh, well, that's wonderful. But then the whole problem is, oh my God, you can ask me and do I wanna share? Okay. Um, and then that led to, wait a minute, the whole defensive structure of the ego can now be explained by how it tries to develop a justification narrative that tries to take into account social acceptability. And boom, that was the psychodynamic piece. So then I have this, and then I'm trying to piece together now to get back to grammar. So li just listen to the way I started to think about, well, okay, what's actually happening is, well, first we share symbolic tagging, okay? Boom, and then what do we have? We have nouns, rock, antelope, okay? And then the argument would be adjectives and verbs will come online after that, okay? So either changes, okay, across systems or difference, okay? Um, and then indeed, that's actually for a long time, here's what I thought happened is that I have the, basically the adjectival screen of consciousness as the mind two, okay? Um, and I actually didn't really differentiate the perceiver and the perceived, so I didn't have a, but, but anyway, so you have your screen. And the argument is that, well, consciousness is making the salient object, that's the noun, okay? And then it changes, that's the verb. And then the difference between now, different kinds of nouns or different chain kinds of changes or adjectives. Okay. So now look at this. Basically then the basic ingredients of grammar serve to me as a, as a continuity between mind two imagery, okay? And mind three, the structure of our grammar, All right? And the really cool thing about that is one of the things that when I came across Wilbur, and saw the relationship of behavior and phenomenology, okay? Now for me, behavior is different than it does for Wilbur because he, he sort of, if you look at it, he sort of attaches it to a flatland of natural physical reduction. For me, behavior means like this conversation, okay? So, so this idea that I could then really blend phenomenology and behavior at the same level, which of course is what we need to do in world, <laughs> like in other words, my interior and your exterior and has to interface with some same level of complexity, okay? Um, 
I then had a map, I had a beginning map of saying, oh, the phenomenologies, nouns, verbs, and adjectives, okay? And I can now map my interior phenomenology with my narrator out here. All right, so that's what I had. Well, when reading your view, when I was listening to your uh, talk with Lehman Pascal describing your theory, and then I actually read Sophia Speaks, okay? Now I have, I have this idea of, well, now, thanks to you, I can be, well, yeah, but obviously everything is defined in positional relationship to everything else, right? So now you get propositional and you can then make differentiations between the verbs in particular ways. And you can have your, obviously, the notation of your perspective, which is the pronoun, okay? So the point of it is, is that with the six features of grammar, okay, the line between behavior out here and phenomenology in here can be traced with an enormous amount of richness by, and I know you know this, I just want the audience to <laughs> see this. The linkage between mind two, mind three, and our intersubjective space can be traced with this map and the grammar, the grammatology. And you can then fill in the interrelations between the behavior out here and the phenomenological experience in here um, with a level of uh, precision and clarity that just brings joy to my meta metaphysical longing heart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I threw a lot out there, but anyway, that's, a, and I don't know if that came across clearly or not, but that was, um, uh, that's been a big deal for me in following your work. So I just wanted to reemphasize that. Wonderful. Now that, that, that's great. And it really resonates with me. And yeah, I, I'm seeing, it's kind of like a fractal, kind of layering or, or reiteration of these elements mm -hmm. um, at, at different levels yep. and with maybe increasing, uh, you know, clarity and, and actual, you know, conscious perception. Right. Um, so for instance, I think when we're looking developmentally, you know, at, at language acquisition in children, we see nouns and and verbs. Mostly, that's that's what gets tagged first, right? Yep. And then, you know, some basic adjectives, oh, big or you know, mm -hmm. you know, colors and things like that. And so those those three seem to be the most concretely graspable and the the things that the 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 child can begin to pull out in mm -hmm. its it's meaning making initially. Mm -hmm. What I was suggesting before, it's like different ways of holding what is the adjectival. Um, there's the adjectival as, you know, or the adverbial or prepositional um, as, you know, as the background, uh, you know, different layers of background towards mm -hmm. conscious perception. Mm -hmm. so, in a sense, there's the adjectival of the experience of, of just phenomena. Yep. And those things, as the infant begins to build a world picture, the first things that it pulls out of that adjectival screen are nouns and verbs mm -hmm. in terms of discrete objects and, and yep. change motion. Yep. And, and certain qualities that it can name and identify yep. specifically as adjectives, even though, so that's two different layers yep. of adjectives. There's the, the, the phenomenal mm -hmm. screen, and then there's the, the child's ability to begin to name that. Yep. Um, and then ag again, it can, you know, at mind three, particularly as language develops, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. begin to be held even in, in different ways and with more sophistication, but there's a kind of like a, yep. a recursion that, that an info, right. something like that. Yeah. No, that'd be, it'd be so interesting to take this model and look at child language development, right? So yeah, I, so that the only other, so what about the word like no? So let's think of, so that's one of the words they earn <laughs> fairly early, right? So that's, a, that's obviously like a valence quality kind of word, right? Right, right. Right. Um, is that a is that a prep? What is a what is no? What kind of word is no? I think it's an interjection. An interjection. Mm. Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah. So there are other other parts of speech. There are things like number and, and yep. um, interjections and conjunctions, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I didn't bring in. Um, but like, but is different from with, you know, yep. it, it's a different kind of, but it, to me, a conjunction still serves a kind of prepositional function. It's, it's right. Both, um, right. Clearly. Right. Yes. That would be a variant, be like verb adverb at some level, but that's a more uh, readily distinguishable thing in the system we're talking about. But yes. Right. So, yeah, I don't <laughs> know if it, it, it makes sense this way, but you know, it, for instance, you were talking in the, the new um, article that you came out with on the philosophy of the garden. You talked about uh, especially mind one being the kind of the third person um, description and mind two being more of a first person description. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then mind three being intersubjective, which we could say second person in the mm -hmm. sense of yep. built built between subjects, you know. Yep, absolutely. And mind one, it depends on where we're approaching it from. I think if it's quadrivia or quadrant <laughs> in mm. language, quadrant right. is, you know, the experience of, and yep. quadrivia is looking at right. something as, right? Right, right, right. And so in that sense, mind one is quadrivia, of, you know, it's what we're able to piece together by kind of looking back and, and um, retroactively piecing together yep. things mm -hmm. and, and then describing it, you know, in third person terms. Yep. Um, which is different from what mind one might be like as a quadrant, meaning is there any, is there any quality to it at all? Mm -hmm. um, and it might not be, it might be purely Mm -hmm. you know, unconscious processing, or it could be, you know, pre-conscious, you could right. say. Right. Yeah. So the, that's a great question. And I think that basically I'll bring in another language and then see if this, this aligns. Cause I think we, we have to be clear about, right. The perspective is key, like quadrant quadrivia. Those are, those are nuances that then are, are helpful. Um, when I was just summarizing uh, David Chalmers, you know, David Chalmers and makes the, uh, you know, is famous for the hard problem of consciousness, yeah. okay? Which he makes famous coming off of Thomas Nagel, um, who really solidified the problem of subjectivity. But what David Chalmers does is he's like, well, there's a hard problem and I can differentiate the hard problem from the easy problem, okay? So epistemologically, the easy problem is essentially mind one, okay? So if you look at what David Chalmers talks about, he's talking about, um, hey, we can understand the behavior and the neuroinformation processing function without any subjectivity from our basic understanding of science, okay? So our epistemology of language game of science allows us to really create an explanatory system around the easy. Now that easy, plugs right into mind one in the sense that it's a neuroinformation processing behavioral control system that doesn't necessarily require any subjectivity. Okay. So that's, that's a significant overlap. Although what I'm then also saying is yes, we, and of course David Chalmers says this too, but this I'm arguing this creates a clear language system that then says, well, if we also, we have that sort of in the here and now way of thinking of science, we wanna go back and think evolutionarily um, so sort of where does the phylogenic start? Like what is, how does it, how does it, clearly there's a nervous system upon which subjectivity emerges out of, at least we're talking animal subjectivity here. Um, so that's another way of playing around with mind one and mind two sort of mind one really is about the easy problem. Uh, mind two can, is the hard problem. Um, there's the epistemological element because you can't see it and play with it from the language game of science. Um, there's the ontological problem of like, yeah, how does subjectivity emerge in the mechanisms of it? In relation? Exactly. Yeah, I think having the, the mind one, mind two, mind three distinctions is really helpful because the, the language of, of mind or consciousness gets used so loosely. That's right. Um, 
And, and so we really need to differentiate those things. I think, yeah, it is challenging still for us to exactly account how does, you know, neurally instantiated information process uh, that we can understand objectively, how does that generate the what it's likeness? Yep. And so for me, uh, I always hover on that and, and, and think, mm -hmm. do we need to think it's generated or can we say that there's a basic what it's likeness all along? Right. But that different structures basically give greater depth yep. to the what it's likeness. I think that's an important distinction and, a, and an important one to reflect on. I really endorse reflecting along those lines. Uh, to give you an idea, because we, I emphasize that the, uh, uh, the enlightenment gap, what I call the enlightenment gap is central these days to my frame and it's the matter mind relation, okay? Um, and, but of course the issue of at least embodied minds is not relative to matter like as in rocks, it's levered to the living creatures, right? Okay. Which already are doing, in, even if they don't have what we mean by conscious experiences, they're already unbelievably engaged in dynamic, autopoetic, you know, processes. It's mind life relation, not mind matter relation, right? So the, and that places it in the proper gradient. If we're then thinking across a continuum, we're gonna place it in the proper gradient of understanding. Um, rather than jumping as if some magical thing comes out of rocks, you know, there's an enormous amount. And the idea that it might be something what it's like to be a tree or, or a grasshopper. I mean, we know plants right now, you know, those something starts eating a plant, it will send out all sorts of chemical processes. It will, it will restrict itself. It will engage in defensive behavior. I mean, that's, that's apparent before consciousness getting placed on it. So if we're thinking about what we're waking up to what's already there in a recursive way, in a panpsychic sort of way, that's a very important insight to keep in the fore. Right. Uh, one way, I, and I don't want to go too far afield um, in, in the panpsychic speculation part, um, <laughs> but way, how I hold it, uh, if, if I'm giving credence to a panpsychic framing, a rock is not conscious. Um, a rock does not have consciousness as a rock. You could say the atomic or molecular elements themselves have the ability to register difference within right. their own autopoetic integrities. Right. Mm -hmm. But the rock is allopoetic. It's put together from the outside. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a distributed internal relationship. And therefore, it doesn't have as a whole... Yep. Uh, any kind of autopoetic um, mm -hmm. internal relatedness that could distribute a what it's likeness across the whole structure. Right. And so the difference between a rock and life is that that autopoetic structure is continuing. <laughs> um, yep. And that, that continuity allows for the magnification of the basic proto registration that might be present in matter, but that gets, um, unpacked yep. at incredibly deeper and deeper levels of, of depth and sophistication and, and nested relationships in the growth of autopoetic organisms. Right, right. Yep. And uh, I make that distinction along the lines of the primary unit of analysis. So of, of particles into atoms into molecules, a, there are ways to primarily think about a molecule, meaning that it has a particular structure that has some degree of coherence, certain molecules that are quite different than a rock. There is a complex, I see a complexification of what would say give rise to prebiotic chemicals, okay? And molecular structures that are actually quite unlike a rock, okay? In terms of having a primary organization that would be giving, uh, consistent with this notion of prehension in their organization that wouldn't be present at all with a rock. That's what I was saying. So be right before things became life, there was all of this, very, very complicated chemical organization. And these entities have structural inside outside organization. Right, yeah, Prigogine kind of helped to unpack yep. that, right? With the whole notion of dissipative structure and- Exactly. Right. So yeah, you know, again, that's a little bit of a yep, field- no, it's a <laughs> speculative, but so, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. And I'm, I'm, I think wherever, the grammatological distinctions can be 
useful without getting fixated on it has yep. to be this cosmology or that cosmology. You yep. know, I'd rather it just, you know, function where it can mm -hmm. to add some clarifying distinctions. Right. For me, the, I mean, the, you know, the, the, I'll just reiterate the mind two, mind three, and intersubjective shared, what systems of justification we build, okay? And then we are, we're also engaged in intersubjective implicit dance. I mean, that's the nature of the human, right? So I'm, I'm behaving, uh, my mind 1B, you could just take a film of it, I'm doing stuff. I'm tracking you at some level, we have some implicit intersubjective. And then because we speak the same language, have the same culture at some level, right? We now have some justificatory narrative process. Now, for me, what Bramish Fictology then does in the most concrete and obvious way is it links the structure of our justificatory thought. What are these meaning making statements and how do they make sense? And how do we bridge those to have an information interface with our phenomenology and with each other? Like all of that has to work or else we would not be able to coordinate, right? Well, the architecture of the grammatology with those six domains, just that to me, that harmonizing circle, I had pieces of that, that harmonizing circles where you, I think we get a lot of beautiful mileage from. Yeah, I'd love to, to try to, you know, unpack that further um, maybe in, in dialogue or collaborative writing or something with you to really think about that or, or just hear what that, you- That's why I mentioned that like children, like I always, cause I, I've never had a chance to um, be like, so here's all just thought experiment here and then we can you know, move to potentially wrap this up or, but so we can watch what kids do. Okay. So the nice thing about the justification hypothesis uh, anchor and systems theory, anchor to behavioral investment theory, is that it takes language and it puts it in the embodied tool use, much like a Vygotskyan kind of vantage point. It says, hey, kids are tracking this. They start to learn this dimension of justification, which means that they're going to utter statements as investments that they're regulating and then tracking the meaning around what are the consequences that this has. So it's actually very Skinnerian too. It's basically, although it says there's an architecture of language acquisition, it says we're tracking justification consequence, okay? And then we're also downloading the rules of what they're learning as legitimate. And that's, that's this dynamic emergence of their system of justification. With the grammatology view that we can now say, okay, they're gonna enter into a subject, inner subjective space. We can now map what we think would be their adjectival and adverbial phenomenology. Right, and then put them in various things, and then see what verbalizations emerge across development. Right, so then you could classify whether it be commands, no, stop, you know, nouns, juice, mommy, right, play for verbs and activities, right, and then you could basically start to then create the developmental structure of grammars that get, you know, placed on. And we talked last time about the first. It'd be so cool to then be like, well, the first kind of layer will be this some sort of propositional uh, uh, sort of relation, move toward, move away, right? And then they'll stack in these other things. And then ultimately, maybe a metacognitive perspectival shift would be another kind of like, oh, I can be above in relationship to this, you know? And then you'd stack it through the, you know, so it starts here and then it evolves through the various grammars, reaches a tipping point, and then they shift outside or above you know, the developmental stage. And then they would start using a whole new layering potentially of grammar and justification on top of that. You could track uh, that potentially across a cognitive developmental stage in a way that'd be unbelievably fascinating to me. That makes a lot of sense to me. And it never actually happened. I, I talked briefly with a developmental psychologist, uh, Terry O'Fallon. Mm -hmm. You heard some of my presentation on, you know, Sophia Speaks and Grammatology. And she said that in observing the unfolding of different levels of, of self, world, and, and meaning making, they also had tracked these changes in language use and in grammar, essentially, uh, that she felt really aligned with the different six elements and, you know, I haven't had a chance to explore how that exactly interfaces with her model, but she did say that, you know, one of the things that they do because they use language assessments in part to track 
the different, right. you know, uh, stages of development and the way that, you know, we're moving from pre-operational, you know, concrete and, and post-formal and, yep. and, you know, more and more sophisticated ways of, of basically structuring self-world elements. Uh, there's a grammar to that. And there's a, a you know, you could say an, an evolutionary fractally unfolding yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. interplay of the grammatical elements at different levels of, of sophistication. Totally. That well, let's put well, we can asterisk that because I always wanted to bring a justificatory lens to like ego development across various things. In fact, I was talking to somebody who was either her doc student, Terry O'Fallon's doc student, or somebody who collaborated, and we were having these kinds of conversations. So we will ask, asterisk this idea that we need a child developmental psychologist. We'll look at grammar and justification and cognitive development through those uh, lenses and see if we, if we can uh, elucidate some of those processes uh, empirically. That'd be really fascinating. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll, I'll reach out to Terry and see if she's available. Great. Yeah, be as excellent. We can have her come if she's willing. We'd have a conversation along those lines. That'd be fascinating. That'd be great. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like both we've covered a lot of ground, and I still feel like oh, there's all this other stuff that we need to get into now. <laughs> but it's been a wonderful conversation. I don't want to strain listeners beyond too much. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say that you know you shared uh, an image with me earlier about uh, Mount Sophia and the elephant sun god and. Uh, I, I'm happy for that kind of intersection in our respective systems in terms of having a mythic image to, um, you know, towards which to orient, even as we're trying to remain grounded as much as we can empirically. Right? Amen. Yeah. So it's a beautiful image and maybe folks will see it or you can share it with it. But, you know, you have you delineated the various symbols of, of, of grammar and they're around arranged around. Uh, Mount Sophia and what I felt and I think this is you know Mount Sophia represents you know wisdom the call to wisdom and um, you know never reaching it perhaps but always trying to climb it <laughs> and the various grammars then represent doorways into that uh, in a what I would call an integrated pluralism okay so the pluralism is a potential doorway but there is actually a mountain um, and so for me if, does that jive with kind of the some at least some of the symbolism that you're after? Very much so. Yeah. Yes, and, and that you know you can enter through any one of the temple doors. Yeah. And 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 find a lot of depth, but you'll find the others reflected, you know, from that vantage point. Exactly. Um, exactly. And so that's so, yeah. So the elephant sun god for me. So this is what it corresponds to directly is the, the mythic symbol of the ultimate good. Uh, viewed through an integrated pluralism. So the elephant refers to the elephant in the famous parable by John Godfrey Sachs, which is different blind men grab a hold of it and they have partial truths uh, and they can maintain contact with the elephant that way. Uh, but there is a holistic picture that can be achieved through the perspective of all of them. And it's that integrated pluralism that gives rise to that. And then that's placed on the sun god as the representation of the ultimate source of energy. Um, uh, and so that an orienting uh, lodestar, as it will. So to me, you know, they're both orienting towards wisdom. They both have an integrated pluralism. They both have sort of an archetype of something men would look up to, humans would, I should say, of course, would look up to, um, uh, to orient us towards reaching our potential and exploring various doorways or pathways to achieve that. Yes, wonderful. And, and that's, I think in those mythic domains are where, you know, the, the base that we were talking about of the preposition of the adverbial also assume, uh, you know, mm. kind of overarching superordinate integrative functions. Beautiful. Uh, right, right. The good and bad that we are in relation to, <laughs> that, that we grew out of. Right. In our sensitive souls that now need to look up to the. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a. I love those endings. So that's wonderful. Wonderful. Go great. up well, and down. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for the the conversation again. It's always um, a rich feast. So thank you. Amen, brother. I really appreciate it, and thank you again for Mount Sophia and uh, and and uh, being oriented that way. Wonderful. wonderful. Yeah, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Take care. Take care.